Okay, so last talk of the day. We have now Alvaro Parra López, uh, who is telling us about scalar and vector dark matter production during inflation and reheating. So whenever you want. Um, thank you. Uh, hello all. Uh, I want to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. Um, today I want to tell you a bit about how uh, gravitational production can explain the observed abundance of dark matter. And we will do this by looking at, uh, well, we will focus on a scalar and a vector dark matter uh, field. So as you know, um, when we consider quantum field theory in curved space time, uh, the notions of vacuum and particle become non-absolute. And in particular, if we, ha if we have a time-dependent geometry, we will find uh, particle production even out of the vacuum. So I like to illustrate this with this uh, figure where we have a group server that's measuring the number of particles in some system and it yields zero. Now we let the geometry evolve and then observe a living after this expansion is going to go and measure the number of particles of the same system. And simply because the notion, uh, the notions of uh, vacuum is uh, different, they are going to, uh, so the orange observer is going to find uh, that the state of my system is not empty. Now, this is going to be especially important during inflation because uh, the geometry expands uh, very uh, rapidly. And the key feature about this is that um, this production is going to happen for any field that's uh, coupled to the geometry, regardless of uh, couplings with other fields. So in the context of dark matter, we don't need to consider interaction with other particles. And this mechanism alone can explain the abundance we observe. Okay, so let me explain how this works for scalar fields. So we will consider a dark matter scalar field in Platt, Freeman, uh, Robertson, Walker universe that is non-interacting and it's only uh, coupled to the geometry via the non-minimal coupling psi. Then the usual thing to do is to go to uh, momentum space and expand not my uh, field phi, but a rescaled version of it in Fourier mode. Okay, we will introduce this expansion in the equation of motion for my field, and we will find a mode equation for the uh, modes of the expansion that is going to have a frequency that's time dependent. Now, the time dependence comes from the uh, uh, scale factor and the rich scalar in this case, and it's going to be determined by whatever inflationary dynamics we consider. Once we have this, we would simply uh, promote our coefficients of expansion to operators, as you know. Okay, so because of the fact that our frequency is uh, time dependent, unlike in uh, Minkowski uh, space, then it happens that two different particular solutions, V and U of my mode equation, are going to expand my field uh, in terms of different uh, coefficients. And therefore, when we quantize each of these solutions is going to correspond to a different set of uh, creation and annihilation operators. Now, these are related by Bogolyubov coefficients because each solution is a basis of the space uh, of solutions of this mode equation. And now we can go back to our previous picture and think that notion of vacuum of the observer before the expansion is associated to the mode, uh, to the solution, to the particular solution V, and that, that of the orange observer is associated to the, uh, to the particular solution U. Now, if we say that our system starts in the uh, zero A state, so the vacuum as seen by this observer, at some initial time, one can calculate what is the number of particles this observer is going to measure in the state of my system. And this is encoded in the uh, beta coefficient of this Bogolyubov transformation. So if we are in Minkowski space, this coefficient is going to be zero. We are not going to produce any particle. Okay, so in practice, what we do is to compare both solutions corresponding to each notion of, of uh, vacuum at the, same, uh, at the same time in order to extract the uh, coefficients. Uh, we will actually do this after uh, the expansion uh, of geometry has ended. The thing is that, of course, 
we do not have uh, an initial and final region where we can define our uh, backend with our problems as in Minkowski space. Um, but uh, we have several possibilities for quantizing our theory. So we have several, um, uh, well, actually infinitely many solutions of our um, mode equation that lead to different uh, notions of, of vacuum. But uh, in some cases, we have some uh, choices that are more natural than others. And what we will go into, what we will assume is that at the beginning, yeah, at the beginning of inflation, we are going to recover uh, the city geometry. And in this case, we know that there is uh, a preferred choice, which is the bunch Davis back. Okay, so the mode associated to this um, to this notion of vacuum is the mode that in the asymptotic pass behaves as a plane wave. Now, for calculating the number of particles after the expansion of the geometry, what we will do is to uh, wait until we reach an adiabatic regime, meaning that uh, after inflation and reheating, we arrive uh, at some uh, adiabatic regime where expansion is so slow that we can use the um, the adiabatic vacuum prescription uh, without any problem. Okay. Now, with these uh, conditions for each of these particular solutions, we would simply uh, solve numerically our mod equation uh, for again uh, the inflationary dynamics that we consider. Now, by evaluating these uh, these solutions, we will extract. Uh, the beta coefficient, which gives it gives us the number density of particles produced per mod k. And if we integrate this, we will obtain the commoving number density of particles. Now, of course, the physical density is going to be related uh, correspondingly to the commoving density by the scale factor. And with this, we will have the production of particles by this mechanism at the uh, end of uh, of reheating, or when we arrive at the adiabatic regime where expansion is so low that no particles are produced anymore. So the thing is that in my field does not interact with anything else and particle production has essentially stopped at this point, then the abundance of dark matter uh, that we observed today, so the abundance of this test dark matter field that we calculated can be um, obtained today simply by diluting this uh, obtained density of particles because of the uh, expansion of the universe, okay? And essentially, we can uh, take, uh, uh, so we can take into account this dilution factor by relating our density uh, with the uh, fraction of temperatures at reheating and today. Now, uh, of course, this is going to depend on the reheating temperature that we choose. But you have here two examples for two reheating temperatures. This is the temperature at the end of reheating. And uh, we have here the abundance obtained for different values of the coupling to the, to the geometry, to the Ricci scalar, and different values of the mass of our uh, would be dark matter field. And the dashed line here corresponds to today's uh, observation, so today's abundance uh, of dark matter. So you see that this mechanism can explain, in fact, the observed abundance. So now if we want to go to vector fields, the idea would be the same. So we have again a non-interacting vector field. And the thing that changes in the action is essentially that now, apart from the mass and the coupling to the Ricci scalar, we can add a coupling to the traceless Ricci tensor. Okay. But of course, the philosophy is the same. We go to momentum space. Now we can split spatial modes in uh, transverse and longitudinal modes. And also, as expected, we find that the uh, zero mode is non-dynamical and can be expressed in terms of the, uh, we can write it in terms of the longitudinal mode. Of course, for this uh, equation to hold, we need that this component of what I call the mass tensor, which encodes all my couplings and the mass, um, is always smaller than zero. This is imposing some constraints on our parameter space for these uh, couplings. But other than that, the theory will be uh, well defined in this sense. Now, from here, we would find again mode equations for the transverse and longitudinal modes. And uh, we see that the uh, mode equation for the transverse mode is essentially the same as we had for the scalar field. 
uh, if we make this new coupling go away and we shift our gamma to sine minus one six. So uh, in the absence of this term, the dynamics are going to be the same as for the scalar field. Now the longitudinal mode equation is quite more complicated. It's again made out of uh, the components of the of the uh, these mass tensor, but uh, I just wrote it here so you see that it's uh, more complicated. Uh, in the end, we are going to solve this numerically, so it's going to get more involved. Okay. And now let me show you some preliminary results. But let's look at this uh, uh, at the frequency of the transfer mode for a moment. When we have uh, when we exit inflation and enter reheating, our uh, inflaton is going to start oscillating, and this is going to cause oscillations in the Ricci scalar and also in the Traisner's Ricci tensor. Now, if you look at this term, when the Ricci scalar goes to negative values, depending on what's the value of the rest of the terms in the frequency. This can trigger some periods of tachyonic instabilities, which are going to make the modes grow a lot and particle production is going to be enhanced. But now that we have this new term that didn't have before with the, with the scalar fields, you see that this doesn't change the sign. So if we, uh, if we assign a negative value to sigma, this is always going to contribute as a negative term uh, to the action, uh, sorry, to the uh, frequency. And therefore, is going to enhance even more than this term, this tachyonic uh, production. So let me finish by uh, showing you some, uh, again, preliminary spectra. So we have here the uh, uh, k squared times uh, the beta squared coefficient as function of k, okay, for the transverse modes. And let's look first at uh, this figure here where the uh, coupling to a traceless rigid tensor is. Uh, is zero. And what we obtain is that as we increase the coupling to the Ricci scalar, uh, the, the importance of geometry becomes larger and we produce more particles. But if we go to negative uh, couplings, uh, sigma, then we enhance these uh, tachyonic uh, instabilities and production grows a lot. Okay, so you can see that as we increase this value, and the negative uh, term corresponding to the sigma coupling loses importance, then we recover uh, production more like uh, the one that we had here. And now, as I mentioned before, in the case of the longitudinal mode, it's numerically much more complicated because of the shape of the frequency. So you can, uh, so you will have to forgive me because I don't have that many points here. So the spectra don't look that good, but we can already see that production of this mode is much more important than production for the transverse mode. Also, you can see that the mass here is even two orders of magnitude larger, and we would expect that production is, uh, so the number of curated particles is smaller, the larger the mass. So you can see that really this production is dominant. And as soon as we uh, decrease a bit the, the, um, the sigma coupling, then production grows a lot because tachyonic instabilities becomes really important, okay? So um, a summary, I uh, tried to show you that a gravitational production uh, in these cases can really uh, explain the abundance of dark matter. At least we did that for the scalar fields, okay? We have all the methodology for doing this for the vector field. We are still dealing with these uh, numerical problems for the longitudinal mode, as I told you. But we already saw that longitudinal uh, mode production is going to dominate over that of transverse mode. And that tachyonic instabilities in this um, in this case that we have this new coupling can really trigger uh, an enhanced uh, particle production. So of course, uh, what we have to do now is to uh, finish the calculation of the abundance for the longitudinal modes, and uh, we could also try to make this analysis with other inflationary models because I didn't mention this but we used a simple slow roll uh, phi squared uh, potential inflationary model, but we could see how production changes with other inflationary models or go beyond and study uh, the spin two case, uh, for example. Uh, of course, at some point, if the density of produced particles, especially because of these uh, tachyonic regimes is in, uh, enhanced, it may be interesting to include the effect of uh, back reaction.
And this is everything that I wanted to tell you about. So thank you for listening. Okay, um, thank you very much for the talk. Time for questions. So any question? Okay, Marco. Hi, at which, at, at, at which time do you evaluate the beta parameter? In when do we? When, when, at which time do you plot the spectrum? So oh. what I, so this spectrum, okay. So this is the commoving uh, the commoving number density of particles. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we find at which time we arrive at the adiabatic regime. At this point, no particles are produced, mm -hmm. and then we extract this uh, final picture of the spectra. And from that point on, this shouldn't change. So, guess you evaluate this later times, you see the same the same yeah, shape. Exactly. Right? So, okay. if you want the physical uh, density of particles, you would have to. Uh, dilute by the corresponding scale. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Okay. Hi, thank you for the next talk. <clears throat> uh, just a simple question. Does it work better for uh, hot models of dark matter or uh, cold models? Because I suppose that you can relate uh, the peak of the mass to the model of, in of inflation that you choose. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the thing is that we are actually assuming for calculating the abundance that in the end we get a cold dark matter because of the density that we plug into the abundance uh, production. So if we want to consider hot, then we would have to extract the abundance somewhat different. I don't know. Yeah, but, um, is it related also, I suppose, to the um, to the fact that the cosmo um, particle production from, from cosmological expansion also depends from the mass, uh, for example, in the on formal coupling case, no, no. So I, so I don't know if I got your question right. But um, the so what we do is to restrict our parameter space depending on if we get the right abundance or not. And for what we have seen and the range that we have explored, the masses of the of the dark matter that we find are still uh, quite uh, heavy. I don't know if that helps. So at some point, the, if you lower the mass of your test field, it's going to be the, the, uh, the which is scalar and whatever couplings you put in the, that are going to matter. So at some point you reach um, that there is no dependence with the mass in this sense. Of course, then when you calculate the abundance, then this does matter. But for the commoving number of, of particle density, at some point, the mass becomes irrelevant in this sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, you answered. But but uh, if the the mass, sh I I guess should be very heavy, no? Because if not, you can have extra production from decay of other like other inter. Of course, you're considering a non-interacting. Yeah. But then, if it's light, then it can be also produced maybe because of other particles of the standard model can just decay on this particle or something like this, right? Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, the thing is also that um, so. Again, this this depends on on the coupling and depends also on the reheating temperature that you can see there. So this is more like a way of restricting our uh, parameter space or showing that this mechanism could work than trying to find what's the uh, right uh, mass of the dark matter. Okay. That, that could okay. Work. But yeah, I mean you're right. So in principle, this analysis could favor uh, heavy uh, dark matter in general. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any any other question? Maybe a last question. If not, I think you are all very tired, so we can just thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Very interesting. <laughs> okay.